Perfect. So, brother, brother Shabazz, man, it's 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 it's, it's great to have you, man. Thanks for taking the time to chop it up with me. Um, again, this is uh, this is streams of thought. It's just uh, you know a free flowing conversation, man. It could be we could take two minutes, we could take two hours. So just feel free. You know what I mean? What's my invitation? It means a lot to me. Uh, I have I have a lot of respect for you and all the great great work that you're doing. And there's a lot of my heart, and I got to get it out. So this is a great opportunity for me to just share my thoughts. So, so oh, once again, thank you so much. Likewise, likewise, man. So so I'm gonna just hop right in. I um I, I showed you a, a song, one of my unreleased uh, joints from the album, the upcoming album, Dangerous Thoughts. Um, I showed to you a few months ago, where the the song begins. Um, I say, uh, "Prisoners of Azkaban, thinking of a master plan." Images of grandeur by Jamel Shabazz and Dapper Dan. Clap your hands, whether you in Patterson or Pakistan. Richard Wright, black boy that grew into a blacker man. And um, you know, I go on, you know what I'm saying, to drop some jewels. Um, when I when I make mention of you know images of of, of grandeur, uh, I wanted to make sure that I was on point with that with that analogy. So I had I, like I, I made sure I went by definition, and the definition of grandeur is is something thought provoking, um, of splendor and impressiveness, especially of appearance or style. And I feel like that's exactly the descriptive that I would use to describe like your images. Um, I feel like there's a level of, of depth and dimension that you're able to bring to your subjects. And um, there's a certain honor and humanity that you bring into the composition that isn't always visible to the naked eye. But once we, we're able to see it through your aperture, um, you know, we're able to see things differently. So yeah, I just wanted to sort of introduce you to the people, to those who may not be familiar, you know, with 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 Jamel Shabazz, the artist, the photographer, the man, the myth, the legend, and um, you know, just set it off like that, man. Again, thanks, thanks for taking this time. Welcome, brother. Well, I'm truly honored that you would even uh, include my name in that powerful song, brother. You know, that that touched my heart greatly. Uh, it, it's reflective of what I do. You know what what you do and what the roots and so many other artists of consciousness uh, manifest in your in your music is reflective of, of my journey and my imagery. So uh, uh, I'm I'm truly touched behind that. But uh, I, I have to first say how grateful I am that I have the ability to see. You know this wonderful divine gift has given me purpose, and with it I strive to to create images that are compelling and provocative, thought provoking to make a difference in this world. It's yeah. not. To, taking images, but I see through my third eye and I see things on, in, in a very different light. Through my work, I'm striving to uh, capture the beauty, the pain, the hardships, the joy, in, in hopes to contribute in some way to the preservation of history and culture. It means a lot to me. That it's bigger than me. It's bigger than photography. It's about uh, my particular assignment that was given to me when I was 15 years old. You know, wow. it was like I was given marching orders. That this, this is my, my path. And yeah. I have duty to take this camera as a compass and just go out there in the wilderness and not only document, but more importantly, engage the people about what's going on, about the destruction, uh, the self-hatred, the racism, the police brutality. Through my images, it's there. It's bigger than fashion. Oftentimes, the viewer sees the Pumas, the Adidas, the posing, but it's so much deeper than that. For me, it's about trying to uh, uh, capture the soul of the person, but more importantly, when I approach the brothers and sisters on the street, I use that as an opportunity, you know, as they uh, pose up for me to speak about the time that we're living and what's going on. That's what this is really about. The camera was the, the, the compass that guided me to them. And I felt that we met on this path for a reason to talk right. about what's going on. Without the camera, you know, those conversations would not be as possible by having it. It allowed me to engage these brothers because we were dealing with a very critical situation. Mass incarceration. Yeah. When the crack epidemic came, we were losing a lot. And I realized that I got to get out there in the battlefield and I got to do all I can within my power to talk to these brothers and sisters and warn them. So the photography just became just a means of really communicating freezing time. But the most, well, what was more important, like I said, was planting seeds in their minds of consciousness so we could just try to move it as, as a collective. Wow, yeah. I feel you on that, man. So that, that sort of explains... Um, really one of the questions that I had for you about how, you know, all of the subjects that you photograph always look and feel so comfortable. 
And I know often it's, it's, it's people that you don't even know, you know what I mean? Like you, you walk up to somebody on the street um, and I wonder what that process was like, you know, how do you get them to feel sort of comfortable? You know what I mean? Like what's, what's, what's your icebreaker? Well, it's done in the spirit of love, first of all. You know, I went out there doing it because I had a genuine concern for the people. So when I would approach the brothers and sisters on the street, I'll say that to them. You know, first of all, I would recognize their, their greatness from the heart. You know, mm -hmm. I'm say, excuse me, brother, with all due respect, man, when I see you, I see greatness, brother. And I, I just want to capture that legacy because I just see something great with inside you. And uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know who you are, but there's something special about you. So the icebreaker is, is forging that, that conversation and recognizing who the subjects are and letting them know that and letting them know that your heart is sincere. You know, uh, when I first started, I always carried a portfolio with me to share mm -hmm. with you what it is I'm trying to do. And I would, I would show photographs of people from the community to let them know that I was sincere. I would show them my business card to say that, you know, here's my card, I'm legitimate. I don't want anything in return other than just to, to, to capture this moment in time and pass it on to you. I don't want anything in return in terms of any financial gain, but I just recognize the greatness within inside you, brother or sister, and I just want to freeze this moment and I'll, I'll come back maybe in two hours and give you a copy of the photograph. And wow. from friendships were established. You know, wow. and I say that back in the old days, we can go to a one hour photo. And I would go to town Brooklyn, put the film in the shop, come back an hour later by the Albee Square Mall and give the brothers photographs. Then sounds start to travel about my intentions. And then a lot of brothers was be began to know who I was and then friendships were established. And I was just doing it on the regular. And uh, so many friendships came out of that type of move. Uh, but stress, uh, chess played a major part in that strategy as well, uh, that process, because you had to have strategy, you had to have patience, you had to have vision. So I played chess before I would leave the house to get my mind in tune and I would go out there in the wilderness. And I had to, you know, and it was about body language too. You just couldn't roll up on a lot of brothers and take their photographs. You had to add to make sure that the frequency was correct. And yeah. uh, she was able to do that and explain yourself. And when I dropped my name, extended my hand, you know, uh, that, that connection was forged. And that was my process throughout my 45 year career, really. Wow, wow, that's dope, man. And you 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 started at the age of 15. Was that like as soon as you realized you had a knack, like you had an eye for photography, or had you known beforehand and at the age of 15 you decided to just make that move? Well, I I, I developed a deep appreciation for photography really early on in life because my father was a professional photographer. So oh. I was in an environment with, with him with his various cameras. Uh he oh, okay. had large library of, of, of history and photography books that I gravitated towards early on. Uh, it was one particular book on this coffee table, Black and White America by Leonard Freed, that mm. really opened me up. It was something special about the book because it, this is not the, the original copy here, but it was this book that, that they documented Black life in the 1960s by a photographer by the name of Leonard Freed. And whatever reason, uh, this is the only book that sat on a coffee table. All the others, other ones were in the library. So about eight or nine years old, I would pick up this book and I started to not only look at the photographs, but read it from cover to cover. And this book, it seemed like it was tailor-made for me as a young black boy coming of age. It was giving me a lens to a larger world outside my community. So early on, I saw the power of photography. I saw racism in this, in, through the images of this book and discrimination. I learned about Angola State Prison through this one book right here, unbeknownst to my father. So way before I picked up the photograph, I, I started to understand the language of photography, the beauty of photography. And after digesting this book, I would go on and look at all the various books that he had in his library on photography. And when I got uh, through with that, I would go on to the, the local library and look at Life Magazine, uh, uh, an Ebony Magazine, a host of other ones, National Geographic, to just process this powerful language of photography that gave me a larger gauge into a world outside my community. So for, from the age of eight years old to, to 14, I already saw the beauty and power of photography, in addition to the family albums that we had in our home. Back in the days, the family album was a tradition that every family had. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Passed on from generation to generation. My aunts and uncles all had photography albums. So in those albums, I saw the power of imagery and the importance of, of family, you know, going back to the 1800s. So early on, I, I saw that photog photography was an important documentation of the culture that needed to be preserved and passed on from generation to generation. It wasn't until I was 15 years old that I actually physically put a camera in my hand. It's a very interesting story because a good friend of mine that I went to junior high school with was telling me about his cousin that was the warlord of a gang in our neighborhood called 
the Badass Stompers, which is the division of a, of a larger gang called the Jolly Stompers. And he kept telling well, me his cousin. Now, what, 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 was that gang in Brooklyn? This is Brooklyn. This is one of the biggest gangs in Brooklyn. It, it actually came into existence in the 1950s, and okay. it carried on into the early 1980s, the Jolly Stompers. Okay. But uh, his cousin was the warlord, and the warlord held a, a, the, the key position because he made war with other gangs. And he told me that was his first cousin, and he invited me to take a trip to his cousin's home in uh, the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn back in 75. So mm. when I went to his house, I was amazed with the whole ambiance. You know, he was this, this, this general that was running things. He was humble. But what I was drawn to was the photo albums that he had. And he had these incredible photo albums that looked like yellow pages from back in the day, big, thick albums. And it was of the game. And Dang. brother, blown away because the Jolly Stompers were official. It wasn't the typical games that we, we see in like the Warriors with uh -huh. cut off jackets. These brothers had on beaver hats with baby oil on them. They had uh, uh, Playboys and it, this is before yeah. the shark skins and brothers was official. They had gold teeth, uh, gold frame glasses and he documented them so well. I was blown away that he had these uh -huh. All the rest, page after page after page, I was just taking. I remember so vividly looking at the albums while cooling the game, playing in the background, rhyme time people. And I was hooked at that point. I vowed that when I left this house, I was so inspired. I want to be a photographer and shoot just like that. So I went home and snatched wow. my mother's 110 camera. She had a 110 and a 126. Amateur, instamatic, but a lot of people had them back in the days with the cubes. Man, I snatched up the camera and it, 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 it was history then. I went back to my junior high school and started photographing my peers, and he gave me a voice. And what I wanted to do was emulate what he did. And then when you look at my work in back in the days, as time would pass, those images are very reflective of what he did. Sadly, I never got a chance to tell the brother, his name was Cornell at the time, how he had impacted me with his work. And, uh, and sadly, all those images just disappeared because those photographs are some of the greatest images I've seen in my life of black culture and black youth. Minds are, are all right, but what he did at that time and his ability to do it, we're talking about like the early 1970s from like maybe 71 to 75 and just beautiful, beautiful photo, well composed, black and white color in front of clubs. And sadly that he, he died a few years ago and that work is lost, but that's when it started. And once I put the camera in, in my hand and looked at the viewfinder, it's like looking through that viewfinder allowed me to look into to a, third, a third eye. And it just transformed my life and it immediately gave me a sense of purpose and it gave me a voice. And I, and I, and I kept, kept holding it on for like 45 years from that point. Man, that's the definition of for the culture, you that's know? And, and, and I, I, I had no idea that your father was a photographer. So it's, uh, it's definitely, it's part of your, your lineage, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's in your DNA. And, um, you know, the, the images that you've been able to capture not only are you, uh, you know, finding your own voice and not only are you giving yourself a voice, you're able to give a voice to literally to the voiceless in that way. You know what I mean? Because you get a chance to sort of, I don't know, like the, the people who, who are in those pictures that you take, they're able to speak through those images. You know what I mean? Um, and it speaks directly to me. It speaks directly to um, like whoever is lucky enough to be able to, to, to process those images. And um, I wanted to take the time real quick and, and, and thank you while I'm thinking about it um, for letting us license the, the image that we use uh, for the cover of, of the Roots album, um, How I Got was no, Undone. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, crazy. That's another image that, that that's another image that, um, I mean, I feel like it spoke directly to me, man, because, because I, um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, flipping in in an abandoned lot on a dirty mattress, and you know, with, with really without a care in the world, and just you know that that I remember, you know, that that innocence and and and, and just being carefree in that way. Uh, but in the midst of you know all that was going on in Philadelphia and how it was, you know, my environment was so comparable to that image that when I saw it, um, it just really it really shook me and moved me and resonated with me in a particular way. I'm I'm glad you allowed us to use it, brother. Yes, sir. And I'm, I'm honored to have that image on that album. And when the call came to me, I immediately accepted it. And I want you to know your piece is back here. This is yours. Yeah, name. yeah, I see it. I see it, man. That's my gratitude for all of what you've done for me, brother. So uh, that, that means a lot to me because that will go on to be one of my most iconic photographs. And when I made that image, that's when my father, for the first time, complimented me and said that you got it, man. He realized at that moment, because he had taught me the science of it, 
uh, light and speed. And that was what created that image. He stressed to me the importance of carrying your camera everywhere you go and mm. understand the science of light and speed. So mm. when I was part in that situation in Brownsville, I had my camera out, set, ready to go. I'll never forget once I captured it, I knew I got it. But when I went to the film shop and got it processed, I was so excited to return home, to return home and show my father that I actually followed his lessons. And that's when he complimented me and told me that you got it, that you got it. You really understand the science of it now. Beyond just taking a simple snapshot, when you could freeze time in motion. Yeah. That, so that image means a lot to me. Again, one of my most important photographs in my collection. That's a beautiful thing, man. I hear you, you keep mentioning uh, you know, going to the, the film shop, like, you know, like the whole task of getting photos developed. Has that always been part of your process or did you at one point do your own film development? Like, do you have a dark room, like even now? Good question, brother. And that's a very interesting story. When I came home from the army in 1980, an enemy who became a friend saw me with my camera and he told me to take a walk with him. And I went to his home and he gave me an enlarger. And that would transform my whole life and the way I saw photography. Prior, I was just taking images. My father had me on the wing teaching me. But once I got the enlarger and I brought it home, my father set it up in our laundry room and he taught me the whole science of development. And that became very magical for me because it took it to another level. And it was an excitement now of processing my own film, then taking the ne negative and putting it underneath the light and creating images and seeing that image come alive. I was totally blown away. I would go in my dark room at like 12 o'clock in the morning, throw in the Supreme team back then, you know, some, some powerful music. Yeah. And I would be open for eight hours. I'll spend eight hours in, in, in that dark room, convert the whole laundry room into it, and I would create my image. And that's when I saw the magic of it. And it made it more intimate now. It's one thing to create an image and take it to a one hour photo. But when you actually create that image yourself, you, it's, it's that, that's when you make an image. And, uh, and that meant a lot to me. So uh, I, I started uh, developing in 1980. Okay. okay. Now, of course, I don't really have the time for it, and I embrace technology. But the early days, that was a very uh, uh, important part of my process. Which, which do you, speaking of technology, like, what, what is your preference? Do you, you know, do you think there's an advantage to, you know, analog, um, you know what I'm saying, as opposed to, wor like, working in a digital format or... Like, is one easier than the other? Does one render for you? Like, is this something uh, different in the quality of the image? Well, to be honest with you now, what's more important to me is really capturing the image, regardless of what apparatus that you use. Even if you use mm -hmm. a cell phone, if you can freeze time in motion, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got analog for many years, and I think I stopped around maybe in, in 2010. And I fell in love with the digital photography because it allowed me an opportunity to show my subjects their photograph in real time. And mm -hmm. it's that expression of joy and satisfaction, that really touched my heart. Unlike with, with the analog where you could approach the subject and convince them to stand in front of your camera and tell them I'll give you the photograph in maybe a couple of hours or two. With the, with the digital, it allowed me to see people and show them in real time what the photograph looked like. And I liked it in addition to the fact that I could email it to them and things of that nature. I, I embraced it for that purpose because I wanted to see that instant gratification. Uh, in this day and time, I don't shoot as much because I've been, again, doing this for so many years. So I have amassed thousands upon thousands of negatives, a lot of the work I have not even seen before. So I'm good now. But I roll often when I go out on an assignment, I carry both. I carry my analog and I carry my digital. Do you take, do you take uh, photos with your cell phone? Not, not really, believe it or not. Maybe basic things just to maybe upload work on Instagram. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's there. But I, I, I don't. I, I appreciate it. I do main, what, I prop, what I do mainly with it is, is video. But in terms of really caption for professional images, I save that for the, uh, the digital camera or my uh, medium formats. Okay, okay. I know, uh, you know we're both, uh, we've both uh, been inspired by the work of, of Gordon Parks. And, uh, you know, I had uh, the opportunity uh, to connect with you. I feel like we, we are connected in that um, you know, I was uh, part of the photograph, uh, a great day in hip hop that was taken in 1998 on that same stoop that, you know, Art Kane in 1958 and then Gordon Parks in 1995 took the images commonly referred to as uh, the great day in Harlem. And then just last year at the Gordon Parks Foundation at their annual fundraiser and gala, you were one of the honorees. And not only did I get to make some remarks before you were honored, but I got to take 
place in another homage to that, you know, great day series in the great day in hip hop as photographed by yourself, Jamel Shabazz. How, how did it feel on that day to be, you know, both an honoree and then to get to, you know, once again, recreate um, such an iconic image? I have to be honest with you. It was one of my most difficult photo shoots ever because oh, wow. I don't really operate on that level. And to, you know, first of all, I was honored with the invitation to create that image. I mean, that, that was powerful within itself. But I think that having to go center stage and on a ladder in the, in the presence of so many people, right. it was very uncomfortable for me. But I had to, like, get past that and create the image. You know, God, well, here I am, move my height. I'm on this gigantic ladder. I'm yeah. sitting, I got everyone looking at me, and that's not really my process, but I had to just go against the grain and make it happen and freeze that moment in time. So it was truly an honor to uh, be able to freeze a very important historic moment in time for future generations to see in the spirit of Gordon Parks. In addition, Absolutely. just being honored by that organization and is doing so much in terms of preserving his history and legacy. Absolutely. So it's an honor within itself, and it allowed me to now get that torchlight and continue, you know, the work that Gordon did to the very best of my ability. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful thing, man. I remember um, in, in my remarks, one of the things that I said, um, uh, you know, when I was introducing you, I said, uh, I can feel uh, the texture of uh, what I said. I said, when I look at a, a Shabazz image, it transcends the senses. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to hear, to smell, and to taste New York. Um, I'm able to feel the texture of leather bombers and sheepskin coats. And I'm able to, you know, hear the bass of the boom boxes in the images. I'm able to hear the jingling of, you know, the gold chains moving around and door knocker earrings. And I feel uh, the hum of Dapper Dan's sewing machine. Um, I'm immediately transported to the most important era of my life, which is my youth. And it's a youth that parallels the youth and the formative stages of this thing of ours called hip hop. Um, how does it feel to be, you know, I mean, in my, in my eyes, you're the, one of the foremost hip hop historians. And in that you've been able to, cap, to capture the evolution of this culture um, in real time, you know, like from the time it began and like throughout the whole evolution. How does it feel? Like, do you feel like, um, a, a gatekeeper in that way or do, you know is it just something that's i don't know well first of all i, I want to once again thank you for those powerful words brother they touched my heart uh some of the greatest words i had heard in regards to my work so you know that really touched me that evening but uh i'm just one of many there's so many photographers out there that documented the early stages of hip-hop you know I, I salute my good brother joe Conzo, you know who was on deck yeah. early on in the South Bronx with Kool Herc and, and Grand Master Cash and, and, and so many of those great artists that, that were really the cornerstone of this movement that we call hip hop. So you got mm -hmm. Alonzo, you got Jeanette Bettman, you got Ricky Powell, you got Ernie Pellicoli, yeah. and so many others. So I'm just many, I'm, I'm just a, a, a part of that legacy, but there's just so many others. But I feel truly honored that, that I can lend my voice in this very important uh, documentation and narrative, you yeah. know? I'm, again, I'm just one of many, and it, it feels good because I feel that the work doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people, and it's a part of an even larger conversation that we need on a global level because what my work has done that really touches me is that it has traveled around the globe and has started this conversation. It has inspired young brothers to be b-boys now all over yeah. the world. Yep. And that means a lot to me when I can go to places like Suwon, Korea, for the R16 b-boy competition and see b-boys from Korea, Japan, China, Belgium, France, uh, uh, England, and all over battling on the dance floor. Many of them telling me that they were introduced to hip hop through my photography. Yeah, that's crazy, man. It's hip hop photography. I just looked at it as just documenting our culture. Then it started to be interpreted as hip hop photography. And it's, it's so much bigger than, than really that itself, too. Yes. Yeah. It's really the documentation, world history, and culture. But at the same time, hip hop has given me a strong foundation to uh, to share my work and you know share it on a global level, inspire. So that that part really feels good. The to touch okay. people around the globe, not only to to embrace hip hop, but also to to, to pick up the camera and want to document the culture based on what what I did and what so many others did. Yeah, shout out shout out to Ricky Powell, who you mentioned. Um, he's a good friend of mine. 
Um, I have very many of his images, uh, you know, prints of his work hanging here in my in, in my home. And um, I know, you know, at that Gordon Parks event, uh, mention was made. I mean, I, I, I think I knew before that night, though, that uh, Swizz Beats and Alicia Keys, um, you know, own the largest collection of, of Gordon Parks works. Yes. Um, who, who has the most, who has the largest Shabazz collection? Or is I, there any? Right. Oh, right, right. <laughs> you, brother, because I look at you as that person who I feel I can entrust this to. You know, it's yeah. something about your spirit, brother, that, uh, and I was sharing that with my queen. I said, it's something about Black Thought. You know, and Swiss has the largest Gordon Parks. And I said, you know what? I think you're going to be that one, brother. So God willing, you know, you could be that, that, that individual because I have so much work. And uh, I'm really developing a special portfolio to you to show my gratitude. But right now, it, it, it'd probably be you, to be honest with you. But right now, besides you, the number one person is my wife. She has it all. This belongs to her. But this is so much. I'm trying to find homes for it. So I've donated a lot to various institutions, the Smithsonian, the African American, so, excuse me, the African American Museum in DC has my work. Uh, the Bronx Museum has a lot of work, but mm -hmm. uh, so much right now. I have, I'm sitting on well over a million images and I need, I need to find spaces for them because it's bigger than me. The work doesn't, I need to pass it on to someone who's gonna appreciate what I've done. And mainly it's institutions. You know, I don't like to sell work. I prefer okay. to have it in places where uh, my community and the cultures preserved from generations to come. Yeah, that's amazing, man. And, you know, it's, it would be, I would be honored. And, you know, it's an honor and a pleasure to, in any way, shape, or form, you know, whatever you're trying to pass off, brother, I will cherish those images and guard it with, you know, my life. And it will, it's something that I'll, I'll pass on to, to my children and to their children. Um, I, I, want, I wanted to ask, you know, speaking, you know, while just again, while we're on the subject of, of Parks, one of the things that I appreciated um, most about Parks as an artist was his ability to cross disciplines and to, you know, work in other mediums. You know, what I mean, he was just as strong uh, as a, you know, as a writer and as a, as a director, as he was as a photographer. He was a renaissance man in that way, uh, a universal artist. Um, have you ever and do you ever intend to work in any other mediums um, or you know, do you feel like just the photography is your thing? Oh no, the photography, the, the photography believe it or not, it's been done already. I've done all I can photographically. Mm. I movies now, bro. I, mm -hmm. I, it's images I missed in my mind. Yeah. It's images I didn't take but I have it in my mind and I have a determined idea to take it to the big screen. I have to show people right now. So uh, Gordon Parks started, he did his first film, The Learning Tree at 59. Yeah. I'm 59 right now. Wow. So I'm waiting now to do all I can to, to start working on films. I've been doing a lot of writing right now based on my journey coming of age in the 1970s. I want yeah. people to really understand the essence of what life was before the crack epidemic hit. So I've yeah. been a mini series called A Time Before Crack. Time Before Crack, right. Big screen. So it could, in a sense, it, 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 it's, uh, we saw the wire in the corner, but if you rewind, what was life like before the 1970s? And there's a void right there. And I feel that I have to feel that, I have to fill that void right now. You know, like I said, I've captured a lot. I've been keeping journals for about 45 years. So a lot of my, my thought process has been preserved. So I feel the need to do that right now. You know, I grew up mm -hmm. in the theater. You know, uh, going to the to the Negro Ensemble Theater back in the days where I developed a profound appreciation for plays. So I've okay. written some more plays based on my life coming up, come, coming of age. So all I need is an opportunity right now to to bring those ideas into fruition. And this is a wrap. But I've written a lot about my time in the military and the things that I experienced while being stationed in Germany. And I feel it's necessary to bring that language out in an attempt to make the world a better place. You know. Wow. I've, doing a lot of inspiration from Spike Lee and what he's done, you know, my Brooklyn Medina brother. Yep. And, and, and that's where I need to be at right now. There's just a lot of stories that have not been told. And uh, when I'm looking at what's on television now and what's streaming, a lot of it is repetitive, you know, and it's like, the stories that really need to be told right now. And I'm not talking about slavery and things of that nature. It's, it's understanding what has been done already, but it's something about the period of the seventies have to be addressed. Even when I watched you in uh, the deuce, yeah. I, way behind that because your character it really resonated with me Reggie Love of course what Reggie was to me were the brothers in which I've been having conversations with for about 45 years the Vietnam veterans so yeah. 
Hip-hop is very close to my heart because I was raised during that era. Uh, I went into the military right after the war. So I feel that there's a lot of stories of the Black Vietnam veteran that has not been told, in addition to the Black veteran in general. So I, I agree. Uh, a really powerful story storyline that has to really be a miniseries about the war. And I want to do doc, uh, documentaries as well about Vietnam. It's something about that time period, because coming up in the 60s, it was on the news. A lot of men in my community were going to and from war, so I saw right. it. But I just felt that that conversation was never really captured well, especially dealing with the African American community. So I want right. those are the two areas I want to work in right now: producing series and uh, producing a series of plays. Man, let's work, brother. Let's work, man. Right, I'm here, brother. Okay. I'm to do this. I felt that we met on this path for this reason. I think that we're in alignment and. Reggie Love just had a story that, 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 that you know, the, the, the Deuce told a small portion of it, but if yeah. I can bring that character back and rewind what was life like in Vietnam, yeah, and some other individuals, that would mean a lot to me. Wow, wow, man, yeah, we need we need to put something together. We definitely need to put something together. Um, man, what else did I want to ask you? Oh, you know what, man, I wanted to ask you about um, the time that you spent uh, working on Rikers Island. Now, I've, I've, I've been, you know, seeing the posts that you've been making recently uh, of a series of photos that you took um, you know, of the inmates uh, on Rikers Island that you came, that you interacted with while you were there. Like, what was that like? What, what, what point in your life was that during? Um, and and what, what was that like for you, man? Like, you know, to be a corrections officer and to see that facility, uh, you know, from the other side of, of, of the fence, so to speak. Wow. That's such a powerful question, and, it, and uh, it's, that's, that's this deep history right there. Well, I came home from the Army in um, the summer of 1980, and my father told me, you know, you're home now. It's very important that you go back to school and you get yourself a city job. So he inspired me to apply for a number of city jobs here in New York City, which I did. You know, uh, corrections, transit, the post office. And uh, correction called me in 1982. And, I, and in, in 1983, I was hired. So I looked at it as an assignment that I needed to be on. Mind you now, when I came home from the service, a lot of my peers had gotten incarcerated. Matter of fact, my, men, my main in, mentor was incarcerated in the juvenile detention center, you know, when he was about 15 years old. And that transformed him. And he came after me and helped to bring me out of the state of triple darkness. And a, lot of, a number of my friends were falsely accused of crimes they didn't commit. So I knew this before I became an officer. I heard the stories of, of being incarcerated for, for certain crimes. And when the Department of Corrections called me, I realized that this was my assignment. This is the path that I needed to be on. Prior to becoming an officer, I had read the prison letters of George Jackson. I knew about Angela Davis. I knew about the prison, the jail riots that took place in Vietnam in the 1970s. I knew about the Attica Rebellion. So I had a clear understanding on, on mass incarceration and I realized that this is my assignment. You know, this is what I got to do. And uh, I accepted that challenge. And when I went in there, I realized that, you know, this is my duty. I got to wake these young men up to the best of my ability. It was, it was like going into hell. And it pained me to go into this facility for the first time. I worked in a place called ARDC. A lot of artists, they rap about it. C-74, Gladiator yeah. School. Brother, yeah, yeah. because it, it, it was the home to a lot of adolescents at that time. 16 to 20 years old. It was a war zone. And I remember seeing a bullpen for the first time. It reminded me of people on a slave ship. It was these young men, black and brown men, packed into a bullpen awaiting to go to court. And it pained me. But at the same time, I heard a lot of brothers call my name out. Brothers who I had photographed maybe a few days earlier or a few months earlier called me out. And brothers I knew very well from the neighborhood. And I realized that this is where I need to be at right here. This is where the work is at. Because prior to that, I was doing the work on street corners, you know, going out to try to save brothers. And that was fine, it worked out well, but I needed to be in the institutions because a lot of my mentors actually came from prison, you know, and they transformed their lives. So I'm there now and I realized that I got to make this thing work. It was, a, in a, it was a, a very bad stage. I had just turned 23, so I'm young, one of the youngest in my class and, and most of my peers uh, were black and brown men from the community. I mean, this is misinterpretation of what does an officer look like? We come from, right from the community. You know, we could have all easily been in there. Right. You know, I accepted that and I went in to do the work. And I was amazed with all of the brothers I knew that were locked up. And I would use that time to try to encourage them, to realize, brother, you in here, 
Malcolm was once incarcerated. You yeah. know, he, he did not fall victim to these circumstances. He was able to elevate himself. So I stressed to them the importance of, of, of reading and, and exercising and being examples too. Because it's like, yo, bro, I need help up in here. It's a right. whole right. In a typical housing area, which is behind me, you have two officers and you have 60 inmates or detainees on any given moment. Because what Rikers Island is, that particular facility, they're detainees. They have not been uh, uh, found guilty of any crime. They are waiting to go to court. Yeah. So a lot of them are oftentimes poor and they can't afford the bail. And this is yeah. before crack. So it was a very interesting time to go into that place. And at that time, it was very violent, brother. It was, it was a terrible space because you had a lot of the Black and Latino uh, detainees at war with each other. And it bothered me to see these, 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 these young brothers slashing and stabbing and robbing each other every day. So I tried to produce a balance by uh, working with a Latino officer who we had that balance where I, he could speak, he, he could build with them and I could build the brothers. Not necessary separation, but mm -hmm. we just needed that balance because a lot of the incidents that took place was rooted in, in maybe the television. You know, a lot of, you know, you may not want the Latinos to watch the Spanish station so cats get stabbed over that. Or uh, someone couldn't speak English so they want to listen to the Latino radio station. So it was, sometimes it'd be over the radio. So we had to produce a balance and I, and I strove so hard to do that during that day and time. And I felt good to have made that difference during, during my time there. But it, it was just hostile, brother. It was very painful looking at some of the young men that couldn't take it, that decided to try to kill themselves because it was too difficult for them. You know, some of these brothers uh, didn't have fathers in their lives. You know, they, they came from, they transitioned from the group home to the, to the jail. Right. It was just a sad state is to see that type of misery every single day, brother. And when I, when I think about the smell, it reminds me of dead rodents, sour milk, and cigarette smoke. So you go in this atmosphere that, you know, it, it's just totally negative. And um, in, in 83, when crack hit, it just took it to a whole nother level, brother. Because before I got on the job, it was a lot of cats went there for just, in a sense, a combination of crimes. But when crack came, I started to see the casualties of war up close and personal. And that really devastated me. I said, this, something got to be done here. Brothers that once healthy, good, strong teachers fell victim and they were just broken men. And I realized I had to work double time to try to save as many as I could. So again, it was a part of my assignment. I spent 20 years, I moved around during my time in corrections. I would leave the job and go into the streets and use that, that, that narrative to further engage young brothers about what was going on. That became a part of my conversation. I said, yo, bro, I'm just coming from the four building. That's not the place to be. You know what I mean? We're losing a lot of people. And mind you now, the war on drugs was in, was in full swing. So wow. I'm, I'm battling in the jail, and I'm trying to save brothers on the street from going in the jail. And we got the war on drugs going on. We got crack in full effect. We got the AIDS virus. So we had all these different elements going on. But again, that was where I needed to be. Uh, to try to reach these people. And I feel good that, you know, I can look back at my career now and even a, a, a number of, of brothers have reached out to me on social media who did 20, 30 years and they mm -hmm. thank me for uh, being a guy for them. And, and that means a lot to me more than anything that the brothers I was able to save inside and give them hope. Wow, wow. Yeah, what, what do you think had more impact on your psyche um, and just more impact on your spirit uh, the time that you spent as a corrections officer or the time that you spent um, in Vietnam? Well, I wasn't in Vietnam. I was in the Army Station in Germany. After oh, okay, okay. Station in Germany in 77. But yeah. I'll say that there's like three different stages of my life coming of age that are very important. You know, coming of age in the 1970s as a 15-year-old kid, coming into the knowledge of myself, that put me on a particular path because I was young, and I was living in what I call the state of triple darkness, trying to find myself. And uh, again, a young brother who was incarcerated came home. He was once a stick-up kid. And he came back to the community, a changed man at 16. And he came back with the determination to save a lot of young brothers. At that point in my life, my parents had divorced. I was going astray, you know, drinking and acting other than self. I wasn't doing well in school. And this young cat rolled up on me and saw a light. And he put me, he put me under his wing. He separated me from my peers that were uh, living a particular way of life that he felt was not righteous. And uh, he put me in his wing. He guided me on the path. He explained to me the importance of education, the importance of knowing oneself and having, uh, having, a, uh, having a responsibility. He yeah. pointed me in the direction of the library, you know, where I started to educate myself and transform. So from 15 
to pretty much 16, I was on that particular path and, and dealing with hard times and not, not being able to really take care of myself anymore. I decided that the best thing for me to do was to enlist in the military to get away so I wouldn't, want, so I wouldn't be a burden on my mother. Now that experience is very valuable because if I didn't go into service, I might have been dead or incarcerated. So it was yeah. a very important journey that I was tasked to go on. And uh, uh, after going to inf basic training in inf infantry school, I was stationed over in West Germany, which is a very important experience for me because prior to going, I knew about World War I and World War II and what took place back then. So I had an idea of what I was stepping into. But the joy of it was to be placed in a position now with people from all over the country. Because the military is a microcosm of society. And uh, you had people from everywhere, you know, from all, all the various states. And where you came from meant everything. So now I got nod to self, I'm in the military, and, and I'm here to, to embark on this journey at 17 years old. And I met a lot of really powerful people that influenced my life. Mind you now, when I got over there, there was a, her a major heroin epidemic where a lot of soldiers were ODing off of heroin, drugs were everywhere. That was one of the, the uh, the biggest problems at that time in the 70s, a lot of drugs. But I was able to sidestep that, cook up with a brother that didn't engage in none of that, and I got into the music, you know, because music was everything. Unlike today where we all got computers, back in those days, being in the military, having steel equipment was everything. So the music really saved me. You know, I got my reel-to-reel -reel and all my equipment. I started buying albums and playing music. I was introduced to the jazz and the RB, reggae, a little bit everything. That kept me going. And while in Germany, I was going to school, I was going to library and still feeding my mind with information, prepared mm -hmm. for the world. And while over there too, I was introduced to the Black Arts Movement because we had a bookstore that carried a, a lot of really solid books that dealt, dealt with Black history and culture. So that's when I was able to learn about George Jackson. I, mm -hmm. I got scripts in the Black Enterprise Magazine, Essence Magazine, and, and a host of books on poetry and uh, the Black Arts Movement. So I was feeding my brain and developing myself and the beautiful thing about that, I started to meet brothers from all over the country that I was able to build with. And as I shared with you when we first met at the Dave Chappelle Block Party, mm -hmm. I was greatly influenced by brothers from Philly. And it was something about these cats that came in from North Philly and South Philly and how they rolled that just really resonated with me. It was something special yeah. about their character. They were righteous. They referred to each other's Aki. And when yeah. we together to, and go to a larger base, I would see even more brothers like that. They had their faded haircuts. And we developed a bond with each other. And that's something that stayed with me for a long time. But um, Germany, I said, it, it really gave me a lot of time to reflect. Even now when we deal with this quarantine, when I was stationed over there, I had a lot of time to myself to just think and develop a strategy. And when I got back to the world, what I needed to do. And I remember Curtis Mayfield's song, Back to the World. Oh, and yeah. That's, that, that's, that's a classic. What's happening, brother? That was the story of my life because when I, when after I did my time over there, I returned back to the states. That was the story of my life. I'm a changed man now. I went in at 17, I'm now 20, I'm conscious, and I'm motivated to bring about change in the community. I came home to a war zone. It's like I'm in Germany, I'm dealing with the heroin epidemic and a, a lot of senseless violence and racism did wow. threat me to a degree. But when I got home, I was amazed that a lot of my peers, their younger brothers, were getting murdered and went into the life. So I'm stepping into a war now. It's like Prior to going in the army, you know, Roots came out in 77. We were on the rise. It was a sense of consciousness and hope and possibility. But when I came home, the gunplay was in and a lot of young men were killing each other. You know, so that was that other phase. But I, I had to just go to, uh, like I said, growing up as a teen in Germany. But Germany was that space that really transformed me because it allowed me and my friends to get away. Because all the, all the ones that went in the military, we had foundation. And the ones that stayed, for the most part, they fell victim to the system. So when we came home in, in 80, we just came home with a determined idea to clean up our neighborhood. There was another movie called Gordon's War, where uh, Paul Winfield plays a Vietnam veteran that comes home to Harlem after the war in Vietnam to a heroin epidemic. That was kind of like how I started to look at my life and how I needed to move. I, I'm a vet now. Let me get my other veteran partners together. Let's maintain our military discipline. And let's work with determination to clean up our neighbor because too many people are dying. So uh, the military played a major part. And I spent the 20 years in correction. That was another major part because, again, I'm on the front lines now. I'm seeing the death and destruction every single day. And I can't accept this. I just can't remain silent and collect, collect the paycheck. I got off the rock, Rikers Island. I'm, I'm hitting the streets trying to save our people. I was yeah. trying to sound the alarm. That's what this thing was about. Again, the camera was a compass. 
and, uh, and, and a microphone at the same time. And I need to use it to let people know you have no idea what's going on. I, this thing is bigger than what you can imagine. All you young brothers that want to sell drugs and live that life, it ain't the place to be. I'm seeing young cats being hit with football numbers. That's not the way to go, brother. If you're going to go to jail, go as a correction officer. It's, it, it's a very difficult job, but I need help. You know what I mean? Because we have a whole lot of our people in there that need to be saved. And, and, and I think that you could do better teaching inside the system than selling drugs because it's short lived. So it was a constant battle trying to save the brothers on the street, brother. But all three stages of my life are very instrumental in making me the man I am today. Wow, that's crazy, man. We gotta, we gotta help to get your story and all these stories, man. We need to get these stories told, brother. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's, that's real. We need to get these stories told, man. So we need to figure, figure this collaborative effort out. Right. And, um, you know, I say it to you every time I see you, um, I hold you in very high regard. I have a tremendous amount of respect for you and for your work. And, um, you know, you, I, I definitely could say you remind me of, of some of my old heads from Philly. And those brothers uh, that you remind me of are the best kind of brother. You know what I mean? Um, so I just want to thank you, man, for everything that you do and for being a role model and for being, you know, a, 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 a powerful uh, uh, you know, conduit for change and, and, and for being in a, the enlightener that you are. Before we, um, before, before we wrap this up, man, I, I just wanted to ask real quick, what, you know, how has the current situation with uh, everyone being uh, on quarantine, um, you know, how has that changed uh, your creative process? How has that affected you as an artist? And um, what, you know, do you see any parallels in what's going on now and what was taking place in the 70s and 80s? That's, that's a really good question right now. What this moment has done for me, it has allowed, allowed me to really take a lot of time to reflect and yeah. appreciate everyone around me because there's a lot of casualties out there. You know, a lot of people yeah. hurt right now. So many people are losing loved ones like at a rate that's just unbelievable right now. So I realized as an elder, I have to be a torchlight. I have to use my platform to encourage as many people as I can to hold on. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a difficult time, but we're going to get past this. You know, we got past past situations. Like when I look about, look at the 70s and the 80s, we dealt with a heroin epidemic. We yeah. dealt with a crack epidemic. We dealt with an AIDS epidemic. We dealt with the war on drugs. We dealt with K2. So for me personally, I've seen all of that go on in our community and we got past it. It was very devastating. But it prepped me for what's going on right now. And I feel at this particular stage in my life, I have to use all of my platform to inspire people to the best of my ability. I'm still active on Facebook, and I try to use that as a space to play insp inspirational music that's okay. a person's heart. Music like the uh, uh, Izzy Brothers, Harvest for the World, and, 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 and songs that, that, that give you, that, that show love and possibility. And, and if it could touch someone's heart, it means a lot to me. Because as I go through my feed, I'm seeing so many people who I'm associated with, with speaking about their pain of losing loved ones and friends. And it's just so many right now. Yeah. So I want to be a, 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 an aide, a mentor to try to help as many people as I can, because it's very alarming that we are losing so many. And uh, we, we see how it's impacting the black and brown communities, brother. And, and no one is really uh, raising an alarm about this right now. And, and, and people are just disappearing. I'm looking around at so many people I know are gone. Uh, within the transit authority, over 50 transit workers have died. These are fathers, mothers, sisters, and brothers who are no longer here. I think about those individuals that are not fortunate to, to properly quarantine, quarantine or in shelters. And now you're in a shelter environment with, with all these different elements, the mentally ill and, 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 and all types of elements sharing bathrooms and toilets. That's not healthy for a child coming of age right now. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact now that we can't shake hands no more. We can't yeah. embrace each other no more. Yeah. We are all coming desensitized with this whole process. Imagine that, brother. The handshake meant so much. And now yeah. we're we are apprehensive of each, of each other. We are now wearing masks as if we needed that to further divide us. So I'm very troubled with what I'm seeing. But like so many of the past hardships that we suffered, we are gonna, we're going to get past this. But 
we need we need all hands on deck right now. So I appreciate what you are doing. I appreciate what D Nice is doing. I appreciate what Quest Love is doing. So many who are taking to social media to play music and engage the people who are out there in, in some form or fashion to help the, with the healing process because we're going to need all healers on deck. And I do believe wholeheartedly that it's the artist community. The politicians and religion, relig religious leaders have failed, but it's something powerful about the global language of art. Rather you what you're saying. Art artist, a filmmaker, a poet. We need everybody to stand up like never before to raise his voice because this is not a local issue. This is a global issue. And our very livelihood depends on us coming together as a newer generation to be center stage now because we're losing a lot of the elders. They've done their job now. They transition and it's a sign for us. But now it's time that we, that we take this moment in deep consideration because a lot of the things that we once did, we can't do no more. And I gotta be very honest with you, brother. And I think about a lot of the sisters that fell in victim, fell victim to stripping and a lot of things that have served as a distraction. You know, we've lost a lot. What I'm finding out today is that I'm able to communicate with a lot more people because they're not distracted, you're home. So I've been picking up the phone, building with a lot of brothers. Yo, bro, I just wanna hear your voice, Black. You all right? I want to build with people to make sure that they're good because before I couldn't do it, because brothers was constantly being entertained and they never had time. So this is a perfect opportunity for me personally to get on the phone and I try to call at least 10 people a day to encourage them, to get some encouragement from them so we can move forward. Wow. Wow, man. Your words are, are so powerful, man. And, you know, I'm, I'm in complete agreement, man. Uh, you know, I, I just want to thank you again, brother, for taking this time and thank you for, uh, you know, the contribution that you've made and, and that you continue to make, man. And just thank you for being, you know, the, the, the positive force that you are. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, I mean, we keep in touch. So I'm looking forward to, you know, when, when we're going to speak again and just moving this thing, you know what I mean, to, to the next phase. Um, you, you speak of possibility. And I agree that, you know, it's, it's definitely a possibility. It's possible for us to make it through this thing, man. And, and on the other side of it, um, I'm looking forward to us, you know, finally collaborating together and, and, and to breaking bread, you know, together uh, the, the, the right way, man. So, man, much love, man. We love you. We love you, brother. Thank you. I love you, brother, and all the great work you're doing. Uh, my, my love has intensified over the past few days. I've taken time to listen to your interviews, and I've been inspired by your whole entire journey because it was your generation that I targeted as a young man. You know, and I mean that to say, I have a photograph I have to share with you before we close that oh, wow. is symbolic to you and so many others. And it, it's the motivation that inspired me to do what I do. And it's a young brother who was about the same age that you were back in the day because you was born wow. in the 70s, I believe. And this wow. is taken in the early 80s. And it reminds me of the young, it's in the train station now. So he's in a train station and the bars are separating us. But what this picture means to me are that a lot of the young brothers that are out there in the street going through a lot of pain and hardships behind the things that they saw. Losing a loved one, like you losing your father and mother. And I think about that. And that's the photograph that serves as a, as a reminder to me of the work that I got to do. I got to go out there and reach those brothers that have gone through difficulties in their life. And I got to see the good and help guide them along the path. So I just wanted to share that photograph with you because, again, hearing the, 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 your story about your, your father and your mother, it really resonated in me deep enough what you could ever imagine, brother. I mean, it, it hit home with who your father was and coming from the top of the clock. Uh, uh, that meant a lot. That's why Philly was close to my home, too, because I had to do work out there to get back for what the brothers in Philly did to me. I felt the connection to go back and try to make a difference. You know, so I just had to share that with you. It, it, it's another conversation. But I always want to remind you of the impact that Philly had on me from Gamble and Huff to all the artists that came out of there. That's my second home. And uh, out of all the cities I traveled to in this country, Philly is probably the, the, the most traveled to place I've been because I always went in hopes that I would find those brothers that inspired me. I never found them, but I found so many others. And I'm happy to have worked with the Mural Arts Program that allowed me to create a mural in Germantown to yeah. honor the community so it's just a lot brother but i just wanted to share that with you that photograph and how your story touched me and reminded me that there's a whole lot of brothers out there and, and also it made me think about gordon parks when he was 16 years old and thrown out of his sister's house and he had to just survive in the streets of a uh, saint paul minnesota so that's why i do what i do because i know there's a lot of young people out there hurting that they need the guidance of the elders to help them on this very difficult path it means so much brother thank you man thank you <laughs> like you just yeah you just blew my mind with that one too bro wow 
and when the opportunity presents itself, do hit me up with your mailing address so I can send you a portfolio because I got to get it out right now. Uh, and I got I got to say, the book of Eli inspired me. The movie with Denzel Washington. Uh, I now at this, at this stage in my life, I've been on this journey, and I got to pass the books out to people. So the fact that you are younger than me, if I can give you one of the books, brother, and tell you the story, the backstory behind them, that's my legacy. If I was to return back to the essence, I know this in the hands of a good person. So I have a tailor-made portfolio for you, brother, that is just one of the many books that I have uh, uh, preserved over time. But I think that you are that best person to give this one special portfolio to because it's, 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 uh, it's reflective of your parents and your personal journey. Wow. Thank you, man. That means so much, brother. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, man. I, I'll speak to you soon. I'll right, speak brother. to you soon, man. Thank you so much. You be well, and I appreciate the opportunity, bro. Likewise, brother. Peace. Peace, Lord.